I will go right now to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 and 35. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered. Somebody say, delivered. I didn't hear you say, delivered. Delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Write this down. You cannot kill giants publicly if you don't kill lions privately. Everyone is called to be a giant killer, amen? God wants to use you to slay giants in your generation. But giant killers are formed in the wilderness, in the desert, where they are faced with lions. You will raise to be a deliverer to your generation. But in order to bring deliverance to your generation, you have to first experience deliverance yourself. Many people today build their public life on private defeat. They build their public ministry on private problems. Pastors, leaders who publicly lead others to Jesus but privately are watching pornography privately struggling with depression, privately battling with nightmares. God does not want to raise people to slay giants who first did not slay lions. If you are here today and you're being attacked by demons, if you are here today and in your private life you're seeing defeat and you're seeing, experiencing all kinds of demonic attacks, it's not because you're the worst person to walk on the face of the Philippines. It's because maybe God is preparing you to be a giant killer by allowing lions in your private life. Lions in your private life is not an indication that something is wrong with you. It's an indication you have a destiny upon your life and God wants to deliver you so you will deliver others. God wants to anoint you to kill lions in your private so that you can kill giants in your public. Somebody give God some praise right now. In my book, Break Free, I share in an introduction how I was battling privately as a teenager. I became a youth pastor at the age of 16. But I struggled with pornography. I was introduced to pornography at the age of 13. And these lions, demons, started to eat my lamb, my purity. At first, I thought it was the problem with my flesh. So I was disciplining myself, which is very important. But see, the problem is that demons don't leave because of discipline. Demons leave because of deliverance. Say this with me. Say, demons don't leave because of discipline. Demons are leave because of deliverance. And I remember struggling at the age of 13 and 14 and feeling like I was reverted. Something is wrong with me. Why am I addicted? I knew it was demonic because something would come on me to watch pornography. I already was preaching at our church as a teenager, but privately I was being eaten by those lions of pornography and lust. And when God set me free, little did I know is that God didn't just set me free. He wanted to use me as a young David then to slay giants publicly, to cast out demons and to equip the body of Jesus and to remind you young men, to remind you young woman that you are no different than me. If lions are attacking you in your private life, the goal is not for you to feel guilty. The goal is for you to repent, to renounce, and begin to rebuke and experience deliverance from those lions. David says, when the lion took a lamb, I went after it, I struck it, and 
I took the lamb back. It's time to take back what the enemy has stolen. Take back your mind. Take back your purity. Take back your sleep. Take back your passion for God. Take back your prayer life. Take back your fasting life. It is time. It is you are the generation of David. A generation of those that seek after God's heart. A generation of those that will slay demons in private and will slay demons in public. Does anybody in this room have that anointing upon their life? The Bible says David killed lions privately and that prepared him to kill giants publicly. Lions will attack those God intends to use. Maybe you're a pastor and you're currently living under attack and you're saying, man, what is happening to me? The enemy's attack on your life could be a sign. You're being prepared. God is preparing you to be a warrior. And God prepares his warriors in the battle, in the wilderness, when nobody sees them and nobody knows them. You can't slay giants if you never fought lions in private. If you're battling right now demonic attacks, today is the day the Lord wants to help you, empower you and deliver you in private so that you will be empowered to drive out demons in public. Even Jesus did not drive out demons publicly until he first faced the devil privately. If all we do is get defeated privately, we can't walk in our destiny publicly. Many of you have been asking God to unlock your destiny, but instead God released lions into your private life. Why? Because you can't walk in your destiny until you begin to walk in your obedience in private and walk in your deliverance in private. God wants you to walk in your freedom privately with your mom and with your dad, with your brother and your sister, with your boyfriend and your girlfriend, with your pastor and with your leaders. God wants you to walk with your computer in freedom, with your television set in freedom so that privately you are killing lions because that qualifies you to kill giants in the public. Any giant killers we have in this this room today. Come on, any lion killers we have in this room today, make some noise if you are a lion killer. If you are a giant killer, make some noise for Jesus. Come on, make the devil nervous. Make the demons tremble. Make the devil be scared. Be scared that you are in this room today because you are about to be a lion killer. Let's go a little bit deeper. Amos chapter 3 verse 12. This is what the Lord says, as a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only the head of a bed and a piece of a fabric from a couch. Look at this verse again intently. I want you to see three things, a ruthless lion, a relentless shepherd, and a rescued sheep. A ruthless lion, the Bible says the devil roams around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want you to see a relentless shepherd who goes for the sheep, this sheep lost everything except two bones in the leg and a piece of an ear. Nothing is left of a sheep. It's gone. This will be a good moment to say, well, we lost this one. We tried, but this one, we lost. The shepherd, Jesus, is so relentless that he will fight for you if all you got left is two pieces of a bone and piece of an ear. In other words, if the devil already destroyed your whole life 
and only two pieces of the bone and an ear is left, Jesus will still fight for you. You're still worth to be rescued. Jesus will still go after you. Even if you lost your whole life to drugs, even if you lost your whole life to some kind of a demon, Jesus is relentless to pursue you and to rescue you from the jaws of a lion. Somebody give God some praise right now. We have a Savior that is relentless. We have a Jesus that is relentless in His love for us. Satan is ruthless, but Jesus is relentless. The world will say, you're an addict, you're a lost cause, and Jesus says, even if they have two bones and a piece of an ear, I can rescue that. Mary Magdalene, seven demons, I can rescue that. A man with a legion of demons, running mental, naked, living in a graveyard, Jesus says, I can rescue that. Two bones and a piece of an ear. My shepherd is so relentless. He goes for you, even if it feels like you lost your whole life to the enemy, your whole life to sin. Jesus Christ is the shepherd, lays his life for the sheep, and he rescues the sheep. Somebody give God some praise for his love, for his grace, for his blood, for his power, for his spirit. Your life can be rescued today. The Bible says in Amos, as a shepherd that goes for the sheep, even if only two leg bones and a piece of an ear is left. You know what this tells me? What you lost is not as important as what you have left. I'm going to say that again. The enemy will always focus your attention on what you lost. Who left you? Who walked away from your church and your ministry? Who no longer wants to be with you? And he will say, look what you lost, the job that you lost. The, maybe the business that you lost. Maybe COVID wiped all of your finances. And you look at your life and you're seeing only two pieces of a bone and a piece of an ear. And you say, what can God do with that? But my God specializes in using small things. He took the dust and made a human body. He took the rib and made a woman. He takes the seed and He makes a forest out of it. God says, I can take five loaves and two feet and feed the multitude. If you give the what you have left in my hands, it will multiply. In my hand, it will do wonders. Because it's not possible with you, but it's possible with me. It's not enough for you. Maybe you have five pesos left. Maybe you have nothing left. Maybe everyone in the church left. Maybe your ministry died and you feel like I only have a little bit of oil. I have only a little bit of oil. But the prophet told that woman that little bit of oil will get you out of your trouble if you put it in the hands of God. Disciples, what do you have? And they said to loaves, to we just have a little bit of fish and we just have a little bit of loaves. And Jesus says, that's enough. This story reminds me, God can do much with little. Drop this somewhere in your notebook. Put this somewhere on your Instagram. God can do much with little. If you got little, if you feel like you are not enough, if you feel like you don't have what it takes, if you feel like, man, if I could have that man's talents, if I could have her looks, if I could have his ministry. Listen, Jesus does not make photocopies. You are original. You were created by God's design. And what you have is enough. And Jesus wants to let you know, if you give him what you have, he will make something out of it that you will never take the glory for. Because 
the glory will belong to Jesus. Two bones and the piece of an ear worth rescuing. Worth rescuing. Now we're coming closer to the deliverance. If Satan controls 99% of your life, the 1% he doesn't is more powerful than the 99% he does. If he took all of you and ate it, and only two bones and a piece of an ear was left, Jesus says, not only it's worth rescuing, I can work with bones that bend their knee in prayer. I can work with an ear that is open to hear the word of God. Don't give more power to demons than they are due. Sometimes people that are demonized feel like demons are controlling me. Devil made me do it. I can't lift my hands. I can't press in. I can't because the demons are controlling me. Please understand. No matter how powerful those demons are, the human will, 1% of it uncompromised, still can cry out to Jesus, and Jesus will respond. I'll prove it to you. Go with me to Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. And we will look at a man who lost everything in the lion's bite. What was left of this man is two bones and a piece of an ear. If you would have looked at this man, you would have said, this man is gone. He's not there. Nobody's home. He's roaming around among the tomb sides. He's naked. He's cutting himself with glass or rocks. He's hauling like a hunted being during the night. He's gone. Nothing is left of his life. Let's lock him up in asylum or mental institution. Let's sedate him with drugs and let him spend the rest of his life in a vegetative state. Because Satan, demons, so many of them took so much of him. He was no longer there. Two bones and a piece of an ear left. But see, I told you about the ruthless demons. And I told you about the relentless Savior. He would go across the sea to rescue a man who had two bones and a piece of an ear left. Who used those two bones to run to Jesus and an ear to listen to him. He had a legion of demons. That's over 6,000 of demons inside of one man. He was long gone. But see, my Jesus is better at saving us than we are at sinning. Jesus is better at rescuing us than we are at getting lost. Jesus is better at delivering us than the demons are at binding us. If the devil today screams and says, look, I got you, Jesus says, you haven't seen what I got. My hands were pierced with nails. I became man to rescue that one, and that one is mine. I know you took their mind, but I will get their mind back. I am the great shepherd, and I will rescue them, even if all that is left of them is two bones and a piece of an ear. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord a clap offering for his relentless love. Let me share with you seven principles from the story of the deliverance from this man and deliverance from demons. So we talked about the lion, private battles, 
yield to public triumphs. We talked about that the enemy wants to take our life, control it, and sometimes we feel like he took all of it and we feel hopeless. But we, we heard today about Jesus who always gives us hope even when we are hopeless because he will rescue us even if there is nothing left to rescue as it seems. And now let's look at the case of a man where Jesus did this rescuing. He rescued this man out of the claws of a lion. This is one of the most powerful deliverances in the story of the Gospels. The first thing I want you to write down is this. The way of deliverance is paved with storms. The way of deliverance is paved with storms. I want you to notice that in Mark chapter 4 verse 35 to 30, 41, before Jesus ends up delivering this man, Jesus faced the storm. I truly believe, in my opinion, that storm was caused by demons. This is why I believe that. Because the word there, he rebuked the storm, is the same word that is used when Jesus would rebuke sickness and rebuke spirits. There was a spiritual force causing disruption on the way to deliverance. This is what I found out in years already of doing the ministry of deliverance from demons. Almost every person, almost, not every person, but almost every person on the way to a conference, a service or a camp where God will deliver them, they experience accidents, problems at home, or these weird, bizarre, unexplainable things. It's almost like demons knew before they did that they are on the clock. And the closer the person got to the meeting, the less time demons have in their life. So th this is just to encourage some of you. Some of the hell you've been going through to get here, demons knew more about what's gonna happen to them than you did. What if that was simply, they were trying to resist you from coming so that you don't get what God wanted to have you. But the good news, you're here. The good news, you beat them. The good news, you persevered. The good news, you didn't quit. The good news, you didn't let the flood, typhoon, or the traffic, or lack of money, you didn't let that stop you. The good news is you pressed in and you persevered. Come on, somebody. And I am glad that you did that because Jesus wants to meet you at the point of your knee. Number two. Jesus' presence does not drive out demons, but makes them manifest. Look at the next verse, Mark 5, 7. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torment me. So look at this. First of all, a legion of demons is living in a man. This man, as we're going to look in a moment, go, went already crazy. Demons have gotten so much control in his life. He's not thinking straight. And now, Jesus is arriving within his proximity. Now, demons cannot hold him back from doing two things. Running to Jesus and getting on, their, on his knees and worshiping Jesus. Now, if you know anything about the devil or demons, you know one thing. They will never, ever want you to run to Jesus or worship Jesus. So the fact that a man had a legion of demons did not let them stop him from running to Jesus and worshiping tells me if demons control 99% of your life, the 1% they don't control is more powerful than the 99% they do. You can still press into Jesus when you feel tormented, attacked, or harassed. When you feel confused, fearful, or scared, and you say, man, there is such an oppression on my life. You can still lift your hands and worship. You can still bow your knee and pray. You can still fast. You can still read the Bible. You can eat in the presence of your enemies. You can press into God even if it's hard. A 
And the man pressed into Jesus. Stop believing a lie. I can't. I can't. I'm going to lie at home because spirit of depression is attacking me. I can't open the Bible because demons are attacking my thoughts. No, 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 no. If that man had a legion of demons and ran to Jesus and worshipped him, so can you. Don't let the devil deceive you and lie to you that he got you crippled. Just because you got a demon, it doesn't mean that the demon has gotten you. Jesus lives inside of you and he owns you and you belong to Jesus. Can somebody say amen? But I want you to notice this. Jesus shows up. This man is next to Jesus on his knees worshiping. Now for those of you who think that demons worshiping, the reason they left heaven is because they didn't want to worship God. Demons don't worship God. They believe in him, they just don't worship him. That's why I always tell people, believing in God doesn't send you to heaven. Demons believe in God, but they don't worship God. So demons, demons didn't worship, it was the man's will to worship Jesus. He ran to Jesus. Yet, look at this, demons don't leave in Jesus' presence. Because He's present, they only manifest. Why is that important? I want to deal with something for those of you who grew up in a traditional circle that says this. If you have Jesus in your heart, demons leave. Then let me ask you a question. Why that never happened in the Gospels? Why when Jesus came to the synagogues, demons didn't leave, they only manifested. Until He commanded them to leave. Why for three and a half years, every place it speaks, Jesus commanded them. It didn't say He just showed up and they were all gone. Which tells me when you become a Christian, Jesus comes to live inside of you. Demons don't leave. They hide or manifest. Which explains why many of us when we became Christians, hell broke loose. Because demons got uncomfortable. And you may say, but Vlad, I had demons and then I became a Christian, they're not there. You can have a mice in your house and when you show up, the mice doesn't disappear. It just hides. When you turn on the light, mosquitoes don't evaporate, they just hide. Just because something hid in your closet, it doesn't mean it disappeared. And I know for a lot of us, it makes us sleep better at night to know, no, my friend, I have Jesus, I speak in tongues, I got baptized, I'm a cell group leader, I don't have demons, I had them before I was a Christian, but when I became a Christian, they're gone. Why? Because my pastor told me, Jesus and demons cannot live in the same heart. Does it say that in the Bible? No. Do you know that you have a flesh and it lives with Jesus in the same body? Your flesh is as bad as demons. Did you know that God is omnipresent and He shares space on the earth right now with Satan? He does. And why is that 99% of all the deliverances that happen, happen on Christians, not on non-Christians? Do you know why? Because Satan, demons are illegal in Christians. In unbelievers, they are legal. Imagine me coming to your house today and saying, Get out! You're like, why? Because I said so! You're like, yeah, well, I get it, but why? Get out! Like, okay, but why? Get out right now! And then I put a gun to your head, like, okay, I'll go. Jeez, go. Just, just, just leave me alone. But how many of you know you will get a lawyer, and tomorrow you'll sue me? Because that house is yours. So when people walk around and say, we need to go cast out demons out of unbelievers. Let's go to the park and just cast out demons out of unbelievers. The first thing the demons will tell you is this, he is mine. You're like, no, he's not. He belongs to Jesus. That's not true. 
and you can drive the demon out and tomorrow that person is going to have seven more tomorrow that person the demons will come back to that person why because they don't belong to jesus they actually belong in that person's house like you belong in yours so who should we cast out demons from from those people in whom they are illegal and those people who want them out because now they believe in Jesus. So this idea that I, and I understand this way offend some of you who maybe went to a Bible seminary and went to Bible college and you're like, Vlad, but this is not true. You're deceiving these people. Let me ask you then a question. The Bible says for Christians, don't give place to the devil. Meaning don't commit certain sins that give place to the devil. If Christians cannot have a demon, let me ask you a question. When we give place to the devil, where does that place he occupy? In your neighbor's house? It tells us not to give place, meaning he can occupy. I remember one member, used to be a member of a church, comes and says, Vlad, I left your church because I don't believe that Christians can have demons. I said, okay. I'm going to ask you only one question. Can Christians give room to demons? Yes, pastor. Yes, pastor. I said, so wait, so help me to understand. They cannot have demons, but they can give place to the demons? He said, that's confusing. I said, that's for you confusing. For me, it's not. I said, your theology confuses you. I said, for me, it's very simple. Demons are like mosquitoes. When they get into my house, it doesn't mean they own the house. It just means they drive me crazy and I want to kill them. When a Christian has a demon, it's like having a mouse in your house. The mouse doesn't own the house. The mouse just irritates you until you get rid of it. So just because a Christian can have a demon, it doesn't mean that the demon has a Christian. It doesn't mean that that demon owns a Christian. It simply means that demon torments a Christian until that Christian gets fed up and says, you know what, get out and cast the demon out and gets delivered and no longer has that mice and no longer has that mosquito. Now imagine this. If you put a sign in front of your house and you said, mice are not welcome here, I hate mice. How many mice will come to your house and say, Oh yeah, we will we, we definitely, we're not going to call. Let's go to the next house that doesn't have a sign. How many of you know mice don't read signs? They only read one thing, openings. If there's an opening, it doesn't matter if you're a president. It doesn't matter if you are the Filipino boxer. It doesn't matter if you're a bishop, pastor, or an apostle. And it doesn't matter if your house is made out of gold. If you have an opening, a mice says, I'm welcome. When a Christian, it doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. If you leave an opening. But pastor, I went to Bible college. It doesn't matter. But pastor, I speak in tongues. It does not matter. If you watch porn, you're going to have a demon. If you practice witchcraft, you're going to have a demon. But I don't believe in that. The same way as I can say I don't believe in mice. It doesn't matter. They believe in me. My goal is not to convince that you have a demon. My goal is to convince every person today not to believe a traditional teaching that is not backed up by the Bible or church history. And not to cause people in this room who are tormented by something that they cannot explain to not experience freedom. Because today, if you recognize, hey, maybe this issue is not just me, it's an unclean spirit. That you can fight against an unclean spirit. Is everything a demon? Absolutely not. But there are things that are demonic. And just because you came to the altar, it doesn't mean they all gone. Either they went into hiding or they started to manifest. And that's one of the prayers that I'm going to do today. That every demon that is hiding to come out of the hiding. And some of you, for some weird reason, are going to feel extremely weird. 
and you're gonna want to run from this place as far as as possible and it's not gonna be you it's gonna be that thing that you've been carrying and some of you even as I'm speaking you're already feeling sick in your stomach why because that thing doesn't like it and that thing is gonna get trapped tormented and driven out but you will walk in freedom for the glory of God come on somebody number three the demons and it's similar to what I just mentioned need to be cast out they don't leave on their own so Jesus' presence alone doesn't cast them out. Jesus, the Bible says, He would command them. If you look at these verses that I'm giving you there, you look at each verse, you will see this thing. Jesus cast them out, cast them out. You will never see one time where it says, Jesus just showed up and demons were gone. Jesus just showed up and they were gone. The Bible says He cast them out, He cast them out, which means none of them leave voluntarily. The person we were talking about today who had a legion of demons, demons didn't want to go. And they don't. That's why sometimes we command them out and they're like, ah, no, I'm not going to go. They don't want to leave because they're like homeless without a body. They want to inhabit a body. They, they will settle for a human body. If they cannot get a human body, they will possess or get an animal body. But they need a body. Without a body, they cannot function. If they don't have a body, they cannot fulfill their wishes and their desires. And if they have a body, they can run freely and affect this world through them. Number four, Jesus had repeatedly ordered the unclean spirit to leave. Mark chapter 5 verse 8. I want you to notice that the word there, it says, He said, the word said there, the Greek tense behind said, is continuing verb meaning Jesus kept on saying come out come out now some of us have a difficult time thinking because we think well Jesus said it one time come out and they were all gone the Greek word for he said meaning he continuously kept saying come out of it come out of it come out of it and the Bible says the demon didn't leave actually it says after that, Jesus said, what is your name? So Jesus starts an interrogation with the demon. Why am I saying this? There is this fallacy traveling around in Christian circles. The power of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, demons leave instantly. It's true, many of them do. But those who don't leave instantly, it's not because there's lack of power. It's because demons do not want to leave. Many times I cannot confirm this by a biblical word, but through the experience, and this experience needs to be taken with a grain of salt. But demons are sent on assignments by Satan himself. If they fail that assignment, they face punishment from Satan. Sometimes, again, this is not in the Bible, so you can take it and throw it away. I would cast out a demon, and the demon would be afraid to leave and if I would push it harder it's because the demon would say that he would fail his assignment in this person and now he will face punishment from his master Lucifer that's even before he gets punishment from master Jesus so you have to know they will fight not to go and so this is this is a battle of persistence that's why we don't just kind of give up and like yeah i'll take jesus name one time we keep pushing we keep pushing until they snap until they break and they're completely gone for the glory of god so the idea that oh i heard so many people who never cast out demons they're like yeah it's, it's a piece of cake you just command them out i'm like have you done it uh uh i was like i ask you have you done it nah, uh, uh. and when you don't do it then you come up with ideas that are not practical or biblical but we see Jesus continuously, in the original Greek tense, it says He continuously commanded them out. Let's go to number five. There are signs that someone has a demon, just like there are symptoms that someone has a fever. 
So there are signs somebody has a demon. And I'm going to give you 10 signs right now. I'll write this down. There are signs somebody has a demon. So it's not about just coming in and, hey, you have a demon. There's a way to check yourself. Like, for example, if you come and you say, I think I have a fever. There's a way to check them. You can say, oh, but, you know, my, my body is hot. You put a thermo is the thermostat. Thermometer, thermometer, thermostat is the one that changes the body, the, the, the temperature. So you put a thermometer and then you see, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, what I've been feeling, these hot flashes, is actually because I have a fever. So let me give you a thermometer right now. For those who are like, Vlad, I don't know, man. You're going to make it seem like maybe perhaps my boyfriend has a demon. So I want to give you a thermometer, not to your boyfriend, but to you right now. Just a simple pen things that you can test yourself on. Especially if you are half of those things, you might need deliverance. Number one, is you have obsession or fascination with death. Skulls, tombs, um, things that have to do with death. Did you know that this man who had a legion of demons lived among tombs? Why would he be fascinated with death? Because those demons love death. They love darkness. And you're like, no, I'm just gothic. I just prefer dark stuff. Yeah. You might have company. We are children of light. Not children of dark. Now, there's nothing wrong with wearing sometimes a dark coat. But if your obsession and drive is toward dark, death, and tombs, you have company. We are temples, not tombs. We're children of light, not a children of darkness. That's why we don't celebrate Halloween. I don't know if you get this. Halloween stuff exists in the Philippines? Okay, you guys, no, no, but this, Fili this Philippine culture has a Halloween? Oh, God, have mercy. You guys have this junk too? We as Christians don't do the people like, no, but I just dress up, this is not real. Are you kidding me? You dress up like a stripper and you think there's nothing wrong with that? I'm going to dress up as a mermaid. That's a demon. I'm just going to dress up as a Lucifer for one night. No way. You can't have, the Bible says, even fellowship with the works of darkness. That means you and darkness don't hang out. So when the world goes and celebrates death and they celebrate darkness and they celebrate vampires, you have nothing to look, oh, but I just don't want to be weird. No, you don't want to be, you don't want to be demonized. Amen. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you might have a demon is you lose control. You have moments in your life where you black out. It's not necessarily you go completely blank and you don't remember what happened. But you were there. You said something. You did something. You don't remember that it happened. Especially anger. Especially outbursts of wrath. When it was over, you're like, I was not in control. And sometimes when people say that we're like, you're not taking responsibility. But in reality, somebody else took control. And you were at the back seat of your emotions. Guess what happened? You most likely have an unclean spirit. Why? Because demons doesn't control you all the time. They control you in weak places and in weak moments. They take control. You do something. You say something. I remember a guy named Alex. His brother died. He lived very close to a cemetery. He was Catholic. He thought it was something good that after his brother died to go to a cemetery and start digging up dirt and calling out on Satan to enter him. So something entered him. He was mad at God for taking his brother. So he called on Satan to enter him. Dug up dirt on the graveyard. Something entered him. He was 17 years of age. After that, he had moments in the day he lost control. Everything would be normal. He flies off the wall, takes a hammer, throws at his mom. And doesn't remember it happened. He goes to school, punches people, and doesn't remember that it happened. They locked him up in jail. 
because of that. He comes to our service, prayer is going on, and he goes, all of this stuff. And of course, our just brought him in. We start praying for him. He has a suit, he has a tie, and everything. And when the demon of death was cast out, he regained control back because the Holy Spirit doesn't take control. The Bible says he gives us self-control. Demons take control. Spirit gives us control. So we control our vessels. We control our emotions. We control our words. And we have self-control. Loss of control over your emotions, your behavior is one of the signs you got company. Number three. Compulsive behavior of self-harm. The Bible says that this man who was living among the tombs would cut himself. And I know that among the teenagers, especially in the West, it's very common practice to relieve yourself of pain by cutting your veins with razors. And I prayed for many teenagers out of whom demons came out and they said well I just do it because my family rejected me and it makes me feel better you must understand you're making unintentional blood covenant with death even if your intention is to relieve yourself of pain any self-harm suicidal tendencies suicidal attempts driving and constantly thinking of swerving across the other highway and hitting the other car Walking on the bridge and constantly having pressuring thoughts to jump off the bridge. That is not normal. Now, do all Christians get tempted with sometimes weird stuff? A hundred percent. When it's repetitive and when it's compulsive and when there's a pressure that's going on on your mind, it's probably, especially when you start hearing voices from the inside, it's most likely not a temptation, it's now a demonic torment. Are you with me? Temptation is on the outside. Torment is on the inside. Write this down. Temptation is on the outside. Torment is on the inside. We all can get tempted. Jesus was tempted yet without sin. But torment is different. I'll give you an example and then we'll continue to measure our temperature. Spiritual temperature. In the Ukraine, I'm originally from the Ukraine. I was born in the Ukraine. I had a teacher that was helping me with math. I was not good with math. This teacher had a demon-possessed German Shepherd. When I said demon-possessed, that dog was so mean. That dog wanted to eat everybody. Thankfully, that dog was on the leash. And when I was a teenager, uh, 9, 10 years of age, even though I was young, but I was a stupid I knew how far the leash of the dog would reach. So what I would do is I would take my math homework, <clears throat> come up as close to the German Shepherd as I possibly can. And they go like this. <laughs> and so I would provoke the German Shepherd, you know, and he would go like, saliva, you know, got me. And he really, he wants to rip me to pieces. But I know he cannot do it because he's on the leash. And so he's at the high and I'm like, Rah! You know, like, and I'm acting just as possessed as that dog, you know, like, yeah. And because, you know, I'm a teenager, so I want to provoke. Because I'm confident he can't do anything. So one day I'm coming to do homework with this doctor, teacher, helper who's helping me. And I don't see the German Shepherd. Now, his chain was connected to his house. He had a, like, little house, you know, where they go inside and they sleep during the night. And so I always wanted to see how things are inside of his house. So I kind of, you know, looked... Okay, I don't see him, so I'm like, okay, he's probably, the teacher probably took him to maybe the house and locked him in the house. He's not here. So I put my homework down and then I walk into the, step into the place where his chain reaches now. I walked in and then I get on my knee. I stick my head inside of his house. He's not there. But somehow I miscalculated. He was sleeping behind it. So by the time I stuck my head out, I heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And I'm turning around and I'm facing this demon dog who's looking at me and I am cornered. I'm on his territory. 
I'm cornered against his house. He goes right at me. He starts biting me. He bit me right here. And he starts going deeper. Blood is gushing everywhere. And I'm starting to lose conscience. And I'm screaming and yelling. And he's going more and more and more. If it wouldn't be for the doctor in time, he would have killed me on the spot. The doctor came, pulled him out of me and had to live stitch me up because blood was gushing everywhere. I almost died that day. And I learned a very powerful lesson. The dogs can bark at you, but they can't bite you if you're not on their territory. If you step on their territory, they no longer bark. They go for the pound of flesh. So Christians all can have the devil bark at them, tempt them. But he doesn't torment them because he torments when you step on his territory. When you step on the territory of witchcraft, when you step on the territory of habitual, unrepentant, consistent, willful sin, you no longer get it. You go, ow, ow. Now it's not temptation, it's torment. For temptation, you resist. For torment, you need deliverance. For temptation, I just needed to walk away from the dog. But when I got bit, the doctor needed to come and stitch me up now. I need to be rescued. Are you with me? Number four, how do you know if there is a demon? And that is constant nightmares. When you're experiencing constant attacks in your sleeps, sexual dreams, sleeping with somebody in a dream or having sex with the same person all the time, a lot of times it's a demon. They call them spirit spouses. And sometimes girls who have sex in the dream with guys cannot get married. This happened recently. When I prayed for a, for a woman who has a problem in relationships, the moment I start praying and the demon speaks out and says, she's my wife. I says, excuse me? And the demon says, she's my wife. I'm married to her and I've been married to her since when she was a child because her ancestor matched me in the water. Turns out, her ancestors dedicated her to Mami Wata, which is one of the goddesses in, Niger in, in, in Africa. And ever since then, this girl started to have a sexual dream with the man. It's the same man that she sleeps with since she was a teenager in a sleep. And that man is a demon who doesn't let her to stay married to a physical man or have children. That's, some of you think I came up with this. I didn't. That stuff is real. And when the moment you, the moment people like that get delivered, that's it. Then they can get, can get married, and now they can have children, and now their life can be changed. And so, sexual attacks in your sleep constant. Now, all of us can get some wet dreams or all of this stuff. But if it's repeated, it's constant demoralizing. That could be part of the sign that there is need for deliverance. Constantly getting shot in the dreams. Constantly getting bit in the dreams. Constantly getting attacked in the dreams. Constantly falling in the dreams. Seeing your mom or dad who died, seeing them in the dream. Eating with somebody like your grandpa who died many years ago. Seeing dead people in the dreams. You're not seeing them, you're seeing a demon. People sometimes come they're like, yeah, my grandpa visits me. Oh yeah, uh, Susie visits me every night. I was like, who's Susie? Oh, uh, it's this person I knew in school, she died 20 years ago. I was like, that's not Susie! That's a demon! She tells me things, and, and usually this is what happens, and Susie is telling me to join her, meaning die so you can go to be with her. I was like, that's a demon! That's not Susie! I need to be delivered from that Susie. Amen? Number five, intrusive thoughts. Number six, intense desire for defiled things. Number seven, you're manifesting demons when prayer is going on. So, number five, intrusive thoughts. Number six, intense desire, this craving, especially for drugs, to watch porn. And it's not just the lust of the flesh, but this like intense craving. It's almost like something is inside of you wants to like eat. It's the feeling of that. Number seven is manifesting demons when you're prayer is going on and you're just like barking. 
prayer is going on and you puking. Prayer is going on and you throwing up. A prayer is going on and you yelling. For some reason, you're like, I don't know what's happening to me. My hands go like this. I don't know what's happening to me. That could be a sign that there's a demon. Number eight is reoccurring problems of your parents. Parents' problems are repeating in your life. Number nine is you have a fascination with the occult. And number ten is there's a paranormal activity around your life. Meaning, uh, doors get closed, lights get turned off on their own. Everywhere you walk, kind of stuff, weird stuff begins to happen. And that could be one of the signs that there is an ugly spirit that needs to be cast out. Now, I want to go a little bit further and faster. Demons torment people. Deliverance torments demons. Right to point number six for deliverance ministry. Demons torment people, but deliverance torments demons. And number seven... We don't have conversations with demons, but we can interrogate demons. The Bible says that Jesus told the demons, what is your name? You know, Jesus interrogated. This wasn't a conversation. Say, hey, bro, how you doing? How was your day? Uh, you doing good? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Legion, how are you guys kicking over there? Are you guys cool? Everybody all right? Okay. You guys ready to go? No? Okay. Just give me a few more minutes. That's a conversation. Interrogation is, who are you? What have you done to this person? And that's why a lot of times when you see us praying or you see ministers praying and the demons speaking out and they would like speak with this authoritative voice to command the demon to say who is his name, how did it enter and what is done to this person. You're like, why are you screaming at this person? He's not screaming at the person. You're actually authoritatively speaking to a demon and command it to disclose why, how he entered so that you can break its grip and cast the demon out faster, especially in prolonged cases amen so i think that's enough for today and i can teach on this until next week and tell you many many stories of lives being changed when somebody gets delivered I'll tell you just one story this uh, just came a few days ago a person i was at a conference and in new jersey prayer started a person started to get oh start getting delivered no, no, no. They, actually, they were not at the service. They didn't make it to the service. So this testimony is they were driving on the phone watching, driving back home because they couldn't stay for the deliverance service. And this is going to help somebody who's watching on Facebook right now. They're driving and watching. This guy is driving the car who, whom I know he came to our school. His mom is in the car watching the live stream. As the prayer is going on, the mom starts throwing up and getting delivered in the passenger seat. By the time they got home, she was completely set free. I get a message, somebody else in that conference was there. And next thing that happens is that I didn't get a chance to pray for them, touch them. In the night, I show up at 3 o'clock in the morning in their sleep. And I'm commanding a Jezebel to come out of them. Now, I can guarantee you, I was not in their house. I was home. At Jezebel, they said, somebody like me comes in their sleep, commands the Jezebel to come out. She wakes up quickly, runs to the bathroom, starts throwing up, and the Jezebel comes out. It started in the dream, ended in the bathroom. Now, I till this day, I don't know how to explain that stuff. What I know is there's no distance for the Holy Spirit. Right now, those of you on the bleachers, those of you here on the floor, those of you in there, and those of you on Facebook, distance is not a barrier for the Holy Spirit. If you are desperate to be free, God is going to meet you at the point of your need. If you are hungry to be free, God is going to meet you at the point of your need. If you are sick and tired of being sick and tired of that unclean spirit, God is going to meet you at the point of your need. If you want Jesus to set you free and you're going to call and cry out, He's going to set you free today. I know that we've been breaking curses. I know that we've been announcing things yesterday, but today is the day when the sun sets free, is free indeed. Demons have tormented your life long enough. Today is their turn to be tormented and go into the pit. I want you to rise to your feet.